By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Fallen Empires Constructed Tournament and this is match number four of my deck, the Unlikely Alliance in the group stage. This is the last, this is the final match. I'm playing against Baron Nick. Maybe you know him, he has a YouTube channel himself. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link below in the description. You can click on it. It'll take you to his um, to his channel. It's pretty it's pretty entertaining. It's all about old school. So if you're into that, you probably are. If you're watching this video, it's worth a visit. He's playing with a mono black deck called Thrall Uprising, and it's a really interesting matchup because I need to win this to advance to the top eight. But guess what? So does Baron Nick. So if Baron Nick wins this one, he advances to the top eight. If I win this one. I advance to the top eight. So there are a lot of things at stake here. This is the first Fallen Empire constructed tournament ever. And, you know, I need to win this one. I need to make it into the top eight, but so does Nick. So uh, it's going to be an exciting matchup here. Before we go to the actual games, we're going to do a short deck deck. I've got uh, deck pictures of both of these decks. Now, if you cannot wait and you want to go straight to the action, click on the timestamp below. That'll take you straight to game one. And here we are going to continue with the deck deck, starting with the deck of Baron Nick. And here we see the deck Thrall Uprising by Baron Nick. And of course, um, the first thing I notice, it's not completely mono black. And I think Baron has made a really good choice here to board in four Dwarven Catapults. There's not a lot of removal in uh, Fallen Empires. So of course you're gonna play with a play set of IO piles, but it's also very handy to have those Dwarven Catapults in there as well. And they're only one red, so they're really easy to splash. They're instant, so you can also play them during the combat phase. So you can actually do a lot of stuff with them. And in all honesty, I'm surprised that not more players have uh, splashed in Dwarven Catapults. Like we see them everywhere, don't get me wrong, but people have just more or less taken the decision to then play with red, go full red and another color. Um, but Dwarven Catapult, it's so easy to splash for one red next, so I think that's a very good decision. If we look at the rest of the deck, it's very much self-explanatory. Uh, we see a lot of Thralls, so it's really typically a Thrall deck. We see that really nice Breeding Pit in there, and of course you can combine it really well with the Ebon Praetor. He's only playing with one Ebon Praetor though. Uh, breeding Pit, in case you don't know, it's one black and three. Um, and during your upkeep you need to do, uh, pay two black to keep it alive. And in your end steps, not during your upkeep, but in your end step, you get an O1 Thrall token. Now, this works really well with the Thrall champions that you see right next to the Breeding Pit. They give all the Thralls uh, plus one, plus one. So then you can have your own little army. And also you have Soul Exchange. And with Soul Exchange, a really interesting sorcery for two black, you can sacrifice a creature to get target creature back from your graveyard. And if you sacrifice the Thrall in this way, you can put a plus two, plus two counter on that creature. And of course, this is a, re is a really nice combination with Breeding Pit using Soul Exchange to sacrifice one of the Breeding Pit Thrall 01 tokens to get a strong creature back like, I don't know, a Darylor, maybe even Abbot Praetor or a Thrall Champion with a plus two, plus two counter attached to it. So that makes it very powerful. Um, another interesting inclusion here are the two Turex Chants. So Turex Chants is an enchantment. Uh, it's kind of color hate. What it does during your upkeep, you have to pay uh, one black first or, or the enchantment is buried. And what it says is whenever a player puts a forest into play, Turex Chant deals three damage to him or her or um, or that player can put a minus one, minus one counter on target creature he or she controls. So in other words, um, it's, it's obvious Baron Nick is really expecting a lot of green decks. Uh, he's told me earlier when we talked about this whole idea of a tournament, he told me that uh, he believes that mono green uh, is one of the stronger um, stronger decks and one of the biggest um, rivals here for uh, for Baron Nick's Thrall deck. So that's probably why he's put these two in the main. So he's expecting a lot of green. We also see uh, Ring of Renewal here, which is a very interesting artifact. It's actually five to cast, five and tap. So that's already 10 mana in, right? So it's it's a lot of mana. That That is absolutely true. But I think it's worth it because what it does, you tap it, then it says discard a card and then put two cards in your hand. But the thing is, if your hand is empty, you don't have to discard a card. Another thing is, if you are stuck with lands, this is also an ideal way to get rid of your lands and to draw more fuel and to get the action going. So I actually, Ring of Renewal is a really good card, especially since most of these games, uh, when you play Fallen Empire only, there are a lot of standstill situations where you'll have a lot of time, probably. Um, so the Ring of Renewal is this kind of mid-game, late-game 
a tool that you can use to kind of get drag your victory over the line to, to fuel your hand to get those cards that you need to keep the pressure on. Now when we um, look at this deck as a whole, there is one place that I'm really missing, that is um, him to Turek. So obviously he's not playing with Hims. Hims regarded as maybe the strongest card in uh, Fallen Empires and he's not playing with it. So that's quite interesting. I think I know why, because he knows I'm playing against Fallen Empire, so there are not that many power cards that I want my opponent to discard, but I've also seen a lot of other players that are playing with him. And actually one of the players told me it has worked really well to attack the opponent's mana base, because Fallen Empire is actually very mana hungry. So when you play him and your opponent is discarding two lands, then he's really stuck and you really have a big advantage. So that's kind of interesting to hear. On the other hand, I can also really understand why people wouldn't play with him to Turek in a Fallen Empire only tournament. I think it's definitely less strong than when you're playing your regular 93, 94 meta, like with EC rules or Atlantic rules, etc. Um, when we look at the sideboard, obviously we see Order of the Emmet Hand in the side, protection from white, so that's, gonna, that's going to work great. We also see those uh, shield artifacts over there. The interesting thing with the shield artifact is it gives plus O plus two to a creature when you tap it. It's kind of like the first equipments that we've had in uh, Magic the Gathering. And the great thing about this is everybody's playing with those IO piles that you can sacrifice to deal two damage. Well, in response, you can activate the shield put protection on that creature and all of a sudden the IO pile isn't killing your creature anymore. So this is the shield can almost be seen as an IO pile counter spell and also it's great protection against those dwarven catapults as well. Now another interesting inclusion in the sideboard here that I want to point out before I continue to my brew is the goblin kites. Now you have to understand there is no flying in fallen empires so goblin kites is just amazingly strong. It's an enchantment one red and one, and um, there's a lot of text on there. I'm not going to read all of it, but when you pay one red, you can give target creature flying, uh, but the creature shouldn't have a toughness greater than two. So, uh, in other words, he can give his mind step throw flying, and then it's practically unblockable because there's hardly any flying in this set. There's actually no flying in this set except for a 2 2 merfolk that you can give flying for one blue. Um, but it can only attack if opponent has an island. So I'm not really expecting to see that card here in this tournament. I mean, who knows, but I'm not expecting it. So mostly, in most cases, your um, creature will be unblockable when you give it flying. So if you use Goblin Kites for one red, give your Mind Step Thrall flying, for example, it deals damage. You can then choose to sacrifice the Mind Step Thrall and force your opponent to discard three cards. So it's kind of a very creative combo way of letting your opponent discard cards. And since it's really hard to draw cards in Fallen Empire format, um, that can be a very powerful combination. Okay, so this is the deck of Baron Nick. Let me know in the comments below what you think of this deck. And if you would play with Thralls, what kind of deck would you build? Would you copy this or would you make any changes? Curious to hear from you. Now let's continue to my brew. Here we have the Unlikely Alliance deck again. So this is game number four for me in the group stages. Now if you want to have a really extensive... Uh, explanation of this deck, all the ins and outs, what you can do is you can click on the link that's appearing right now. That'll take you back to game one where I give a very extensive deck tech. For now, I'm just going to quickly go through this for the people that maybe haven't seen this deck before. So as you can see, it's blue, black, and red. And basically what I want to do is I want to get Hummer spawning that out, which is an enchantment for two blue. And for two blue and one, I can sack a blue creature and I get 1-1 one, one Khamerit tokens equal to the casting cost of the creature. To give you an example, a Hummerit warrior is 1 blue and 4 to cast. If I then sack it to my Hummerit spawning bed, I get 5 1-1 one, one Khamerit tokens in return. So that's pretty cool. And if I sacrifice a deep spawn, I get 8 1-1 one, one Khamerit tokens. So that's kind of the idea. And then I'm playing with this very obscure, and I have to admit, pretty bad enchantment called Tidal Influence. What Tidal Influence does is when it comes in, into the game, you put a tight counter on it and all your creatures get minus two, minus O. Oh. So the blue creatures, I should say. So the first thing it does, it weakens all your blue creatures. Then each, um, each turn in your upkeep, you put a tight counter on it. Um, then when it's got two tight counters on it, nothing happens. When it's got three tight counters on it, and here's when the magic happens, all my blue creatures get plus two, plus O. Oh. So what I'm hoping for is to create a really big Comrade token army, so all of these little 1-1 one, one crabs, and then um, lobsters, I guess, or crabs, or lobsters, or Hummerids, whatever. Hummer, they're, technically, they're Hummerid babies, the Comrades. So what you want them to do is you want them to get, in, in, in turn three, when there are three tight counters on Tidal Influence, they will all get plus two, plus oh. So all those little Comrades, all of a sudden, are now three, one creatures, 
And then if I have a Goblin War Drums on the field, um, it's going to be really hard for my opponent to stop them because Goblin War Drums is an enchantment from Fallen Empires for one red and two, and it reads um, every creature that you now have needs to be blocked by at least two creatures of the opponent. In other words, your creatures have menace. So all my 3-1 Cumbria tokens will have mana. So it's going to be really difficult for my opponent to uh, block. So in a perfect world, what would happen is the following. I would cast my Humberit Spawning Bad. I would sacrifice my Deep Spawn to the Humberit Spawning Bad. I would get 8 1-1 Cumbria tokens. Then uh, my Tidal Influence would go to Tide Counter number 3. All my Cumbria tokens would get plus 2 plus 0. Oh, and I would attack with 8 3-1 Cumbria tokens. And because there's a Goblin War Drums on the field they will have menace. And yes, this is a very unlikely scenario to happen, but it actually has happened. It happened in a previous game that I played against Gideon, and it was fantastic. So actually he had Spore Flower on the field, so it didn't really work, but still, it was really a great moment for me. So that's basically what this deck wants to do. Now, once again, if you want to know more about this deck, uh, just click on the link that you saw before. Go to game number one where I give a very extensive explanation. I explain why the Conchorns are in there. I explain why the Storage Lands are in there. I explain why the Fuldalian War Machine is in there. You know, there, there are a lot of stories and ideas and tricks behind this deck. Maybe you'll see them against Baron Nick if, uh, if we're all lucky. I want to say if I'm lucky enough to draw the right cards. Um, okay, this is, this is the deck tech section. Let's go to the games. Game number one, and here we go, and it's Baron Nick on the play. He's sitting on the left, I'm sitting on the right. As you can see, we're both playing with penny sleeves. That's a nice detail. Uh, it really takes me back, and it looks like we're both keeping our hand. There's an Ice Age basic land, a swamp there from Baron Nick, and I'm playing here with foreign black-bordered Italian lands, and they have the, uh, the old tap symbol, the T, and there's a second swamp here from Baronic tapping, bringing a mountain into play, playing the Io Pile. So that's this artifact. One tap and sack, two damage to any target. It's one of the strongest pieces of removal in Fallen Empires. This is an interesting card here, Armor Thrall by Baron Nick. It's a 1-3 creature. You can tap to sack it and it puts a plus one, plus two counter on another creature. So it's very good defense against the Io Pile. And there's my second mountain. No blue mana for me. I think that's a bit of a problem. And there's a Mind Step Thrall. And now we have an interesting situation. I can sack my Io Pile to try to kill the Mind Step Thrall because it's a 2-2. But if I do, Baron Nick can actually sacrifice um, his Armor Thrall. And this is interesting. I'm choosing not to use my Io Pile on the Mind Step Thrall because the Armor Thrall was tapped if you can still follow it. Instead, I choose to cast the Darylor, a 4-4 creature, and also a Thrall, another Mind Step Thrall here by Baron, and he's passing turn for now. And this is interesting. What am I going to do? I think it's important here to keep one mana untapped to use the Io Pile if he decides to attack uh, with all of his creatures. Look at that, another Io Pile. And let's see, what I can do now is use one of the Io Piles to try to kill a Mind Step Thrall, and then maybe Baron Nick is going to respond by using his Armor Thrall, giving a plus one, plus two counter on there, and then using my other Io Pile to finish him off. I think that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm now sending two damage to a Mind Step Thrall, and now Baron Nick has to decide what he's going to do. So he's going to sack it, and that means it's now a two, a three, four creature, and then you use the other Io Pile to kill it. So basically, I've used two Io Piles to kill two creatures, and that's exactly what I want to do. The difficult thing here is if I, okay, I decide to attack, so I guess I have another blocker then maybe to deal with the Mind Step Thrall. Because remember, the Mind Step Thrall, when it deals damage, Baron Nick can choose to sacrifice it to make me discard three cards. So this is an interesting choice that I'm making. I'm saying, you know what? attack me i don't care so there are a few scenarios here maybe i have a dwarven catapult and yes i have a dwarven catapult here to take care of um the mindset throw so that was a bit risky of me because if baron nick would have played another creature before combat then uh i would have been in big big uh problem i would have had a big big problem sorry but i'm now realizing in response i can actually simply cast dwarven catapult on response of casting so i was actually pretty fine here um, anyway, it's looking pretty good for me here, swinging in with another 4 damage, and it looks like Baron Nick has, has mana issues, he has to discard his Ebon Praetor, ay 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 ay. so he only has 3 mana, and I'm now finding my island, so things are not looking great for Baron here, playing a Homerate Warrior, and remember, I also have the Goblin War Drums, that means that uh, Baron Nick needs to block all my creatures with at least 2 creatures. 
And here he is finding his land number four. So at least that's good news for Baronique here, playing a Breeding Pit. The interesting thing here with Breeding Pit is you actually get the O1 Thrall token at the end of your turn, so not during your upkeep. Sometimes people make a mistake because you have to pay uh, two black during your upkeep to keep it alive. But I don't think it's really gonna gonna help Baronique here. Swinging in for seven, he's on one life, playing another Darylord to make matters worse. And um, yeah, he actually has to pay two to keep, to keep the Breeding Pit. But because all my creatures now have uh, Menace with Goblin War Drums, it's, I mean, this is a pretty cool play, by the way, using a Soul Exchange to sacrifice his Thrall Token, getting the Ebon Praetor back. And this is now a 7-7 seven, seven First Striker. And he's got another throw, but it's it's too little too late, but it is a beautiful play nonetheless. And here we see uh, game one going to the unlikely alliance and just pretty unlucky here for, for Baron Nick not finding that land number four. Because when he did, man, you saw how quickly he got a 7-7 seven, seven Evan Prater in the actual deck. So now we're going to our sideboards and we'll catch up back to you in game on number two. Game number two, and it's the Baron on the play here. Or actually, oh, it's me on the play. He's choosing to let me go first. And uh, I mean, you know, it's it's an interesting choice. And I think maybe it's even a good choice. And I've started here with my storage land. And as you can see, there are counters on there on that storage land. How it works, um, I think this is called the Dwarven Hold. Every turn, it's, uh, it's tapped during your upkeep, you can put a storage counter on there and then you can also choose to untap it and then you can tap it and you get X, you can take X storage counters off of it to get you the mana that you want, in this case, red mana. Now look at this, I've got serious mana problems here, only finding the Dwarven Hold. And is there a Dwarven Catapult here? Yes, there is to take care of the Daryl Lore of Baronic. Baronic does not have any mana issues. And here you can see the strength of a pretty much monocolored base deck that Baronic is playing. I'm only finding red mana here and remember, I'm playing with blue and black as well, so I need, especially I need the blue mana. Look at that, a breeding pit here by Baron Nick. And I mean, he's just gonna trample all over me if I can keep this, uh, if he can keep this up. So I'm on 16 life, tapping stuff again. Uh, Dwarven Catapult to at least kill one of his Thrall tokens. I mean, I mean that's kind of a stretch on my side here. And there's an IO pile. And I, I think I'm too far behind at this stage in the game to actually get a win here in game two. So it looks like Baronic is going to steal this one from me. Uh, attacking or going down to eight. Well, steal this one. What I mean is I'm not drawing uh, the lands that I need. And he's drawing okay, I guess. I mean, he's got his, his little breeding pit situation going. He's got his Darylor. Look at this beautiful Thrall Champion. And Thrall Champion gives all the Thralls plus one, plus one. And all of a sudden now he's zero, one thralls from the breeding pit become one two creatures i'm already on one life i i guess what can i do here tapping the storage lands getting four mana and am i doing that am i not doing yes i'm playing a catapult choosing not to play the catapult the difficult thing here is because of the thrall champion all the little all one thralls got plus one plus one so there's not really anything i can do with the um, uh, with the dwarven catapult at this stage, I feel so. I'm I'm looking at like what's my best play, and I'm just uh, discarding the Darylor here. Passing turn, he's attacking in response. I'm using the dwarven catapult, but it's it's not really gonna matter. I think this this game is really summed up in one thing: mana problems. Uh, for me, and of course, uh, you can now see Baron Nick's deck in full swing. And that is actually one of the advantages, of course, when you choose to play just one color. So that's what Baron Nick is doing. He's saying, I'm playing black. I do splash in a little bit of red for the Dwarven Catapults, uh, but that's it. And, you know, I've come up with this ridiculous uh, three color deck. You know, this is a risk you take. That's why I play with the Conch Horns. Didn't see any Conch Horns, and I was stuck on land. I mean, that's what happens sometimes when you play this type of deck. So let's quickly continue to game on number three. Game number three. So let's see what's going to happen here. It's 1-1. One, one. Let's hope, keep my fingers crossed here, that I get the right lance. Uh, because obviously a throw that can go really, really quickly, as we saw in game number two. So there's a basic swamp for both of us. Second basic swamp. Finding a conch horn here. Actually pretty happy with that. That will hopefully allow me to find the right lands. There's a Goblin Kites, probably coming in from the sideboard here from Baronic. Drawing two cards here with the Conch Horn, having to put one back on top. Playing a Sand Silos, the storage land. 
there's a mind step throw ay, 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 ay. and there's of course the combo as well he can give the mind step throw flying and remember when he when it's unblocked he can sacrifice it to let me uh, discard three cards I'm already getting the cards out here he's attacking so this is a great start from Baron actually and I really need Niopile. So he's choosing not to sacrifice it. He's giving me a chance. He says, you know what? I just want to deal damage for now, uh, bringing you down to 18. So he's taking a little bit of a risk. Uh, a double Iopile here. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Untapping the sand silos because I'm feeling the pressure here. And will we see? Okay, tapping three here, playing the Fodalian War Machine, an 04 Merfolk Wool, a defender, I guess you say these days. And I can tap a Merfolk to kind of get into the Valdalian War Machine. And then I can choose, or I can let it attack as an 0-4, or I can give it plus one, plus two. And now he's attacking again. Again, I'm showing, he's giving it flying, by the way, with the Goblin Kites. And now he's forcing me to discard Tidal Influence, a Deep Spawn, and a Basic Swamp. So that's that's actually pretty much okay. I guess I'm pretty lucky with that. And there's another Mind Step throw. Man. How much more discard can I take? I guess I just have to play out my hand as fast as I can here. Playing an IO pile, at least that's a nice weapon against that last mind step throw there. And uh, I guess we're having a little bit of a discussion about this. Like, what's the right thing to do here? Uh, I really do do like to see this again the Goblin Kites and the mind step throw combo. It's really cool. He's basically. This mind step throw is going on this raggedy ornithopter made by the goblin kite, uh, the goblin kite itself, which is, looks like a raggedy ornithopter. He goes in there, flies over my Fuldalian war machine wall, and then forces me to discard cards. It's just a really funny scene. Um, and it, it looks like he's really in the tank here. He's thinking, what can I do? Tapping four, and there's the Breeding Pit again. I, th I think Breeding Pit is making a really good impression on me so far, just getting those tokens. And remember, there is no enchantment removal in Fallen Empires. Another IO pile from my side. I guess I'm maybe saving up for a huge deep spawn. The, the problem is here, if Baron Nick can get enough mana to, and he can get a Thrall Champion, I mean, a lot of problems for me. Uh, playing a soul exchange, bringing back a mind step throw with a plus two plus two counter because he used a throw on the soul exchange. Again, another really nice combo here from Baron Nick using the breeding pit soul exchange combo. Uh, so that means he's now has a four four uh, mind step throw. That's just crazy. So he can now just, I mean, it has summoning sickness now, but next turn he can attack and he can just, uh, you know, kill my Fuldalian War Machine because it's no four. There is, oh, interesting, the Hummerid spawning bed. This is pretty cool. So I can, um, I don't have the mana right now, but I can choose to sacrifice, use my Hummerid spawning bed um, to sacrifice my Fuldalian War Machine and get uh, three Cumberid tokens in return because the casting cost is two blue and one. So uh, it looks like we're, we're chatting a bit this game. Uh, Baron Nick's really nice guy. We always talk a lot about like crazy strategies. And I'm already getting my comrade tokens ready there on the right side of the of the screen there. Let's see what Nick is gonna do playing an armor throw. So now he's empty-handed. But things are looking pretty good for Nick, I must say. I'm a little bit jealous about his board state. There he's attacking. And I'm taking the damage. Only have one card in hand. I'm saying, you know what? If you want to sack, it's fine. Untapping the Dwarven Hold. Taking two counters off. Okay, so I've got a lot of parts of my combo now active. Unfortunately for me, there's just way too much pressure on the board here. I now do have two blue and one open to use my Hummerid spawning bat. So if it decides to attack, I can block and then before damage is dealt, I can sacrifice it to the Hummerid spawning bat. And now let's see, so he's attacking with both. I'm choosing to block on the 4-4 and then sacrificing it before damage is dealt. That means I get three 1-1 one, one camera tokens and I don't take the damage from that one mind step throw. I do take two damage from the other mind step throw. And I'm untapping the sand silos. Am I going to cast a deep spawn? No. Okay, that's a bit, that's a little bit unfortunate, but this is not too bad either. Playing another full daily in War Machine and he's playing a Dwarven Catapult to get rid of all my camera tokens. Actually, in couldn't I have sacrificed my Fuldalian War Machine in response? 
Let me know in the comments below. I, I think maybe I could have done that. And then get so many counter tokens that actually um, the damage could be divided. I'm doing the same trick again, blocking the 4-4 before damage is dealt, sacking it, three counter tokens on the board. It's nice actually here you get to see kind of how I want to use the Humber spawning bat. Unfortunately for me, um, there's just, you know, too much power here from Baron Nick's side. Interesting, it looks like I'm attacking with two comrades, so maybe I have Dwarven Catapult in hand that I want to use later. And there is a Darylor, so a 4-4 blocker now for me. Again, a Dwarven Catapult. Ay, ay, ay. Those Dwarven Catapults are really breaking me up right now. <sighs> there is, uh, this is another Armor Thrall, I believe. So remember, the Armor Thralls, he can, oh no, this is um, a Basil Thrall. You can sack it to get two black mana. So it's kind of ramp in a throwaway. It's all about sacrificing with the Thralls. And he's not thinking what he can do. He can actually use both of his IO piles to kill my Darylor. I, I think that's actually a pretty good move. Well, he can also attack, and then if I choose to block his 2-2, two -two, so I think therefore, oh, he can sack his armor throw to save it. That's what he's gonna do. So then I can use the IO pile to kill it, right? I think that's what I should do. I'm not doing that. Why am I not doing that? Life is a bit of a mystery for me right now. But um, I'm choosing, I'm, I think I should have used my IO pile there. That's uh, that's a mistake from my part. And now it looks like Baron Nick is gonna win the game. Look at that Thrall Champion. Bam. I'm just gonna use my IO piles because why not to kill the Thrall Champion. And then am I still alive? No, 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 no. Too bad. I kind of feel, I felt like there were a few moments in this game number three. First of all, very well played by Baron Nick with a lot of, really nice to see his deck with all the synergies with Goblin Kites, uh, you know, Thrall Champion and th those kind of cards. Um, but I kind of feel there were a few moments in the game, um, for example, where I could have sacked the other Fodalian War Machine in response to his casting of the Dwarven Catapult, where I could have kind of saved, get me out of that situation, have a lot of 1-1 blockers. Also, um, I should have used that second IO pile when it did that Darylor block um, on his 4-4 uh, uh, Mind Step Thrall. But hey, I, I think when you look at the, the whole game three, I still would have lost, but you never know, you know, and if you can get an extra turn, turn or one or two, maybe you can swing the game around. You never, never know. Anyway, uh, this was it. This was match number four. Unfortunately, I am not going to advance to the top eight, but for all your Fallen Empire fans out there, don't worry, um, because I'm going to show you matches from the top eight, matches from the semifinals, and I'm gonna show you the finals right here on Timmy Talks. So if you want to see that, stay tuned. Every Tuesday, uh, I'm putting a Fallen Empire match on the channel, so stay tuned and you'll get to see the finals as well. Maybe let me know in the comments below if you think a mono black deck is going to reach the finals, yes, or no, and if you know it already, don't tell, because we actually had a live stream of the finals. So if you know that already, don't spoil, please. Um, thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. If you want to support us, sup, if you're not a subscriber yet, but you probably are. Also, thank you for watching this without an ad blocker. That really helps a lot as well. Uh, leave a comment, leave a like, share this content on your socials if you love it. You know, help me help the channel grow. Uh, also, you can become a Patreon, so you can join us on uh, Patreon. This was actually um, a Patreon organized tournament. So if you're a patron of the channel, you could have joined this tournament. So maybe that's nice to know. So check out, you can already join from $1 uh, a month if you can miss it. So have a look on the page and uh, see what you get if you become a patron of Timmy Talks. Talking about patrons, let's go to the end scroll and let's check out all the patrons of Timmy Talks. What shall we do?
Peter's thinking to Sumba Kazi. 